cost of harm reduction. Um, and somehow these two issues are, are in dialogue with one another. So 350 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere is reckoned to be about the safe limits and we're way over that. So we're, we're already in a dangerous place and our first task really needs to be to stop increasing the problem, as we all know. The IPCC have suggested that if we were to halve global emissions by 2030, we stand half a chance of limiting, um, limiting climate change and avoiding tipping points and runaway climate change. Others are less optimistic. So Jim Bendel, who we'll hear more about later, um, has concluded that our climate appears to have entered a phase of rapid non-linear change, which our societies and agricultural systems are ill-equipped to withstand. The point of no return cannot be known in advance, and so ambitious programs of carbon reduction and drawdown are more urgent and critical than ever before. And so all of what follows can be thought of in that context. Today, we're at one degree of warming above pre-industrial levels, and we have seen many catastrophic disasters and a vast number of casualties associated with that. There is a time lag in the climate system. So even if we were to completely decarbonize overnight, we still need to draw carbon out of the atmosphere down to safe levels before temperatures may begin to stabilize. This process could take decades. If all countries were to meet their current commitments under the Paris Agreement, we are reckoned to be on track for between three and five degrees of warming by the turn of the century. And so a certain amount of change is already locked in. Nobody knows exactly how much, and this may well depend upon our response as a species. But we shouldn't assume that our present economies, systems, and social structures are going to be capable of weathering the changes that are coming. And so together, these factors really form the motivation for having this discussion this evening. And this was all captured with great clarity by George Monbiot. So his, his quote was on the Eventbrite, but I, I think bears repeating. So he said, two tasks need to be performed simultaneously, throwing ourselves at the possibility of averting collapse as Extinction Rebellion is doing, slight though this possibility may appear, and preparing ourselves for the likely failure of these efforts, terrifying as this prospect is. Both tasks re require a complete revision of our relationship with the living planet. And that last point is, is really, really quite key and links to ACAN's third aim around cultural transformation. So George Monbiot is not sugarcoating it for us there. Um, these are challenging topics and we invite you to be attuned to your thoughts, but also your feelings and emotional reactions as we proceed this evening. And to know that however difficult, these are also part of the process. The aim tonight is not to induce a sense of hopelessness, but instead we seek to broaden our conversation from averting the worst case scenarios to working out how we can best prepare for the coming changes. So that's more than enough from me. Um, we're going to move on with the show now. So, it's a real privilege to introduce our first speaker. Bill Getting is a practicing architect, professor of architecture, and deputy director of the Center for Architecture and Built Environment Research at the University of the West of England. He is a member of the Bristol Advisory Committee on Climate Change, a vice chair of the BRE's Global Impartiality Committee and was the RIBA President Sustainability Advisor from 2003 to 2009. He has a particular interest in adaptation of buildings to our changing climate and was closely involved in Innovate UK's Design for Future Climate programme. So Bill, it's really great to have you with us this evening and with that I'm going to hand the mic over to you. 
Okay, I'll try and share my screen. It worked before. Um, oh, I'm not being allowed to share at the moment. Oh, now I am. Great. Let's hope this works. Right, can everyone see my nice slide? All change. Um, I, I'm going to talk pretty specifically about adaptation. It's um, in the time available, there's a limit to what I can say, so it's going to be quite general. If you're a glutton for punishment, there's a, a video that I did of a, a talk I gave to the University of um, Sheffield a few years ago, and that's up on the screen, and I think it's going to be in the chat box as well. Um, Right, so you will have seen graphs like this in the past. So this is a graph of global uh, mean temperature against time from for the past 250 years or so. And the temperature has been fairly stable and started to rise through the Industrial Revolution. And then around sort of 1950, roughly when I was born, um, things start to kick off. Um, and we now look into the future and try to look into the future by using uh, climate models based on different emission scenarios and these are the emission scenarios used in the last um, set of climate projections the 2009 climate projections um, there are more recent ones but most of the guidance is based on the 2009 so i'll stick with that so high medium and low um, emission scenarios and you can see that the future is very different from the past um, this is where we are now um, 2020. I've been using this graph for a few years and I moved this bar across from time to time uh, and nothing else on the graph changes, unfortunately. So um, buildings last a fair time. So um, a building will last at least 30 years before um, significant things need to be done to it. Um, and um, even in that period of time, um, the the the, the rise in temperature we can expect, depending on the scenario that eventually um, transpires, is greater than it has been since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Um, we tend to de we design on the basis of historic climate also, so we're designing on the basis of uh, averages of, of, of up to 30 years ago, so that's problematic in itself. Um, a building will obviously should last longer than 30 years, um, so the, you know, the further you go into the future of that building, the more the level of change we will have to uh, deal with. Um, those changes take us into catastrophic territory um, for um, humanity, for many species, for economy, for our social um, fabric, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously that's why there's been global efforts to try to limit the amount of change to that two degree mantra and now um, to a one and a half degree mantra. I think you know, having a more ambitious target doesn't necessarily make it easier to achieve. Um, and you'll notice that these these scenarios, the temperature rises from these scenarios, none of them um, are below those thresholds. So they're all in effect failures. So there's a sort of weird disconnect between uh, national and international policy to keep um, level of change to two or one and a half degrees and yet um, we're being asked to prepare for um, changes that are greater than those so there's a, there's a weird disconnect between those two approaches wouldn't it be nice if there was a curve that um, turned down below those um, uh, below those thresholds so that in the latest climate projections there is um, a representative um, concentration pathway as they're now called which does it's a, it is a, almost a success um, pathway. It doesn't say how we would do that. Um, and, you know, the question is whether that is actually a feasible um, uh, challenge. So if you look at the uh, emissions projections, those low, medium and high, this is looking at um, uh, annual emissions through the century. Um, the dotted line on the previous slide, we would need to be doing something like that which is something like um, a 4% exponential reduction in emissions um, year on year. Now, whether we can achieve that is, you know, discuss. Um, and if we just put those building, um, 
those building lifetimes or you know lifetime to first maintenance onto that um, timeline. Um, what we need to be doing is to design buildings that are sort of that are fit for um, a future where our emissions are going to be you know ten or twenty percent um, you know at, at the very least of where what our emissions are now. So that's that's our challenge, not to design buildings that are slightly less unsustainable, which is what, where our focus is at the moment. Um, so the, the two challenges that are completely linked. Um, one is mitigation, which is to reduce emissions um, so that we don't get into that catastrophic territory. So to limit the damage to the climate. The other is adaptation, which is just simply to recognize that the climate has changed, is changing, will change, um, and to design for a different different climate um, based on projections rather than past experience and no one's really done that before so that's a massive challenge and there are things that you can do as a designer that can tackle both agendas simultaneously um, but there are things that if you if you focus too much on one of the ag agendas um, then you actually make life worse for the other agenda um, I was asked to look at um, the challenges for the for, for the built environment by the Technology Strategy Board back in 2009-2010 when they were putting together their Design for Future Climate um, program where they were going to sponsor I think uh, 50 um, live projects um, give them each about 100 grand each to in effect uh, redesign those live projects as if they'd been thinking about climate change um, and they are and I put together um, a sort of primer on the issues as I saw them and I think that they relatively can be broken down into quite simple um, headings um, comfort construction and water so comfort is primarily keeping cool um, in, a, in a warming climate and construction is thinking about how um, the climate might affect uh, the way buildings are built or how materials behave so for example um, if you're building on on clay soils, um, drier summers might um, reduce the moisture in the in the soil, and um, you get get more um, subsidence from you know, clay soils cracking up at a deeper level than they have before. Um, materials might behave differently. So, for example, um, uh, brick, which we um, obviously not waterproof, but rely on keeping the water out by absorbing water and then releasing it as it dries out. If the climate changes significantly, they might, might not dry out and you'll get water penetration, particularly if you're you know, doing internal insulation on existing solid wall buildings um, with joists built into the wall, you could have catastrophic um, uh, consequences of wetter walls causing rot. And then water, very simply, too much and too little. What do we do about drought? And what do we do about flooding? I, I know one of the other speakers is going to talk more about flooding. Um, there's a context to trying to tackle these challenges. Um, first is that climate change is a regional issue um, and the challenges that you face in southeast London in a built up area close to the continent um, are not, not the same as you might uh, face in rural Scotland. And so you need to be focused absolutely on your locality. Um, the second is the existing stock. We always talk, and I do, I'm afraid, talk about new buildings and how we design new buildings the whole time. Um, adaptation is it's a, it's a conversion job, not a new build job. We've got to convert our existing buildings and our existing urban morphologies um, to deal with a new climate. And no one's really done that before. So that's a, a massive challenge. Um, and uh, finally, the, you can't just throw energy and carbon at the problem. So you could obviously keep cool just by putting air conditioning in every building, but that makes your mitigation problem worse. So that's a classic example of trying to you know, deal with one agenda and making the other agenda worse. There are tactics that you can follow. Um, the cheapest would be behavioral ad adaptation, but that may not be available to us as designers, but it's certainly available to governments. So for example, um, if we all started work um, at the crack of dawn in summer rather than leaving it until eight or nine o'clock, 
um, we would reduce the, the sort of thermal load on buildings um, hugely by you know, avoiding the um, peak temperatures in the afternoon. Um, as you know, the siesta, that's a classic um, strategy for doing that. So th those would be cheap and um, easy things to do, but not available to us as designers. Um, timing is another issue. You don't need necessarily to solve all the problems um, that you might face through the lifetime of the building when you um, first build it. You obviously want to get things like foundations right. You don't want to be fiddling around, digging up underneath the building um, 20 years after it's been built. But uh, things like um, cladding and window systems, they are temporary uh, installations and, and services. They might last 30 years or so. And you have an opportunity then to upgrade them um, to deal with um, the climate as it then is or, for, or the climate as it will be for the next 30 years. Um, but it, that means that there's a, it's really important to develop an adaptation strategy rather than an adaptation solution. There are no, there are no climate proof buildings. All you can do is to develop a strategy for dealing with, with change. Uh, we do know where we're going, we just don't know how fast we're going to get there. Um, the other issue is scale. Not all problems need to be solved at the level of the individual building. Um, we're ingenious um, characters architects and engineers, we like to solve uh, problems, but actually some problems might be better solved at, at a, a, a larger scale. Um, for, for example, is it better to have to build a new reservoir or is it better to have individual rainwater storage systems um, and all the embodied energy that goes with that? Um, and then the other issue is, can the market achieve this? So I think the, the, the hope with the, the uh, Design for Future Climate project was that one might be able to demonstrate that there was a market for adaptation. Um, but I don't think there is really, because um, what you're asking probably someone to do is to spend more money to try to, to save somebody in the future energy and, and money and to be more comfortable. And the market doesn't like those sorts of things. So I'm a fascist under these circumstances. I think regulation is the answer rather than relying on the market. Um, so what, what do we do as professionals? Uh, I think the minimum professional response is we have a duty to understand the issue. So you know, we are the experts. We design buildings in an environment. If that environment is changing, we need to know how it's changing and have some sort of ideas about how to deal with it. Um, we need to raise the issue with our clients early. Um, this is becoming you know, more of a current uh, topic. Um, but again, we are the experts. Your client won't necessarily understand the implications of climate change for their building. And we have to be able to explain to them what those might be. Um, however, uh, and if your client says, right, I, I, I've got it. I want you to design a, a building that has um, resilience to this changing climate. You need to be very clear about what climate you're designing for. As I say, there's no such thing as a climate proof building. You have to define the parameters with which um, your building is is designed to to meet. Um, and if your client says, um, "I don't care, um, just design me a building that meets building regs," um, that is no license to design stupid buildings. Um, so designing, um, you know, dark coloured, lightweight, overglazed penthouses is is not uh, is not a legitimate, you, you don't have free reign to do those things. You have to design things that um, uh, perform uh, perform well. So I think that's, that's the agenda. Or you can obviously rely on the experts. Uh, and uh, thank you, Donald, for knowing everything. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, yeah, that was a really insightful kind of overview of many of the, the key issues and it's really a lot for us to unpack there. So I hope we can get into some of that later in the discussion. So yes, if you do have questions for Bill or any of our speakers this evening, um, yeah, please go ahead and ask those in the chat. Uh, please try to keep those concise and indicate who, would, who your question, which speaker your question is for. 
when the time comes later in the discussion, we'll be unmuting people to ask their questions. And so, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our second speaker for this evening. Kay Michael is a theatre maker, co-founder of Culture Declares Emergency, and co-director of Letters to the Earth. Culture Declares launched in April 2019 as the first sector initiative declaring a climate and ecological emergency with pledges to tell the truth, take action and seek justice. A growing international movement with over a thousand individuals and organisations declared it includes the National Theatre and Anthony Gormley. Letters to the Earth, the first creative campaign of Culture Declares Emergency, invites people around the world to write letters and create community in response to the climate emergency. The award-winning book, Letters to the Earth, Writing to a Planet in Crisis, has been called an important testament of the times. Okay, wonderful that you can be with us this evening. Um, so yes, over to you. I think I'm unmuted. Yeah, thanks, Tom. And that was really great to hear, Bill. Thank you for that as well. Um, I'm going to share my screen. See if this works. Yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah, firstly, thank you for inviting me and having faith in my ability to speak to an audience of mainly architects when I basically know nothing about architecture and struggled even just to build a polytunnel recently. Um, as Tom said, I co-founded Culture Declares Emergency last year, and the first seeds of Culture Declares were sown in the week before Christmas in 2018, during a week-long deep dive into deep adaptation with a group of academics, scientists, activists, parents, entrepreneurs, artists, and Professor Jem Bendel. We spent the week deeply interrogating via imaginative processes exactly what Jem meant by deep adaptation, collapse, catastrophe, extinction, and our own systems of denial. So Jem had self-published a now seminal paper explaining how the mainstream research and policy community on adaptation to climate change is based on the assumption that our current society, society can continue rather than collapse. And he wrote of deep adaptation to distinguish conversations based on acceptance of the likelihood or inevitability of near-term societal collapse due to climate change. Now, looking closely at the climate science, which he details in his paper, he noticed that predictions he'd studied at university decades ago were coming true far sooner than scientists thought they would. There was also discrepancies with what the IPCC and others were reporting. And he came to conclude that the collapse of modern civilization is now inevitable, that climate catastrophe is likely, and that extinction of human beings is possible. Now he offered four concepts and questions to guide people as they consider this predicament and make sense of the disaster we face. Resilience, what should we keep and how do we keep it? Relinquishment, what do we need to let go of in order to not let matters get worse? Restoration, what can we bring back to help us with the coming difficulties and tragedies? And reconciliation, with whom and with what should we make peace so as to lessen the suffering? It was a breakthrough week looking at his work, sending some of us into a spiral of despair over that winter, and when out the other side, movements were born. As the activist Joanna Macy calls it, we began to see with new eyes, we all asked ourselves the same question, what is our role, our purpose now, in the face of this? Now, Jem sees deep adaptation as a framework for many kinds of responses and priorities. For me, it's provided the opportunity to reflect on how we might have disconnected from each other or our own deeper values, the earth and community and how we can keep all this knowledge to heart without returning to denial or staying in despair. 
How in the face of possible human extinction can we live well? Arguably it was from this place that a project I co-founded, Letters to the Earth, was also born, recognising the need to express our feelings in response to all this and for that to be a transformational process in itself. Grief is understandable and in the face of collapse it should be felt and expressed for it to be, and, and it should be expressed so that it can be composted and transformed into something else, something perhaps empowering. Now, Jem wasn't the first to talk about or warn about collapse, but what does he actually mean by this? And are we already in the midst of it with the current pandemic? His definition of collapse is as an uneven ending of normal modes of sustenance, security, pleasure, identity, meaning and hope. Rather than just an environmental, economic or political, the word societal is important as these uneven endings will pervade society and challenge our place within it. For many, especially in the global south, it's worth stating that collapse is already a lived experience. This isn't something just coming to the developed world some, some time down the line, and that should not be the only reason for action. There are billions on the planet already experiencing the full direct effects of accelerate, accelerating climate change. 40% of the human population is already affected by water scarcity. Many are forced already to migrate from hot land and drought. Many are already having to relinquish life as they know it and many are still struggling for recognition and survival under colonial systems. And in more than the human world, we are living with an ecological collapse already, a system which supports all life. So GEM's framework doesn't deny collapse, either now or potential. It looks at it right up close, but there is a small possibility of averting it, so what would averting the collapse of modern civilization look like? Now, this is a diagram drawn by yours truly. Um, see if it makes sense for you. But if we were to deny that our house is on fire, as Greta says, and if we continued with business as usual, with infinite growth, pushing at Earth's limits, then we're in for a shock. And that's what that, that's, that star is. There's always a breakdown following a shock to any system that reaches its limits. You could say then that there are two choices, the path of extinction or the path of reorganizing and renewal. Deep adaptation is the space of possibility between acceptance of how bad the situation is, i.e. a graceful energy descent, and collapse, which could look like pockets of surviving humans scattered across the globe. Now that space of possibility is where the work of deep adaptation lies between acceptance and the so acceptance being the dotted line and collapse. And it might be there that you find the courage to take action. Now Rupert Reed, who some of you may know is a spokesperson for XR, but is also an environmental philosopher and critical friend of Jen Bendel's, talks about transformational adaptation. He says that yes, what's being accepted is that dangerous climate change is here and it's going to get worse for a long time. We're on a business as usual trajectory where current policy takes us on a course for a global rise in temperature by at least three degrees, which crosses the thresholds of tipping points and is called catastrophic and close to existential by scientists. So we have to talk seriously and do adaptation. But Reid argues that the adaptation currently being done is relatively shallow or maladaptive. It can actually worsen the climate change situation, such as building higher sea walls, which is highly carbon intensive. But he also argues the risk in a deeper adaptation agenda that doesn't actively work towards a transformed civilization that could emerge from collapse, however unlikely that might be. So transformational adaptation is halfway between shallow and deep. It's an adaptation that is adaptive. Like Bill says, it, it's something that looks to the future, it's simultaneously mitigating, i.e. improving the overall climate situation, whilst also transforming society in the direction you want for the long term to bring about civilization transformation. 
So rather than building seawalls, we could restore wetlands that are absorptive of carbon so that we don't have to intervene as humans. So the question is, how might the architecture actually benefit nature? How can architecture put the earth first in this way to work towards a transformed civilization? And this brings me to regenerative design, which some of you may have heard of, and for me, sits well within the deep adaptation framework. If we were to relinquish our assumptions of continuation and growth, or that we can just prevent the worst from happening, we could instead foster a culture of repair and do so straight away, so that everything we do has a positive impact in terms of restoring ecosystems, taking carbon out of the atmosphere, and even supporting communities. Nature offers us solutions for this. Michael Paulin, a lead architect of the Eden Project, works with biomimicry. Now the Sahara Forest Project aims, for example, to provide fresh water, food, and renewable energy in hot, arid regions. Its greenhouse replicates the Namibian fog-basking beetle, an insect that harvests its own fresh water in a desert to create fresh water to grow crops inside the greenhouse and any excess is used to revegetate the surrounding desert landscape. So these examples of architecture that I particularly like give back to nature and make a positive contribution to the improvement of the environment. They build for and with nature, protecting all species and all ecosystems. For example, a green roof might be pleasant for humans and reduce energy consumption in the building underneath it, but a regenerative green roof also supports butterflies or birds that have otherwise vacated an urban area. So in regenerative cultures, people and companies create the conditions for more life, more diversity, more resilience and anti-fragility. It is the antidote to extractive industry and may be the best practice on offer to heal our planet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kay. Um, yeah, that was very sobering at moments, but I think included a, a lot of issues that we really need to have a reckoning with at this point. Um, I would just say as well that we, we really appreciate bringing people in from outside of our silo to offer that kind of perspective. So yeah, very grateful to you for bringing that this evening. So again, if, if there are any questions as we go along, please do pop those in the chat box. Um, we're now going to go for a short five minute break. So do go and get a drink or whatever else you, you need. And let's meet back here just after five past eight and we'll hear from our final speaker. Thank you very much. Okay, so welcome back everyone. I think we'll, we'll make a start. So yeah, I hope everyone managed to, to have a short break and, and get a drink. So yeah, without further ado, we're going to move straight to our third and final speaker. So it's a real pleasure to introduce Jean Clark. So Jean is an architect sculptor based in Europe. In her studies at the Architectural Association, Jean focused on questions of domesticity as a way to challenge societal issues and adapt to planetary crises. In 2019, her research was published in Home Truths by Real. She's a co-founder of A Action, a student group at the AA working towards cultural and pedagogical shifts in architectural education necessary to obtain climate justice. Sorry, I chewed that last line a bit there. Um, so yeah, Sean, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Tom. And thank you everyone for coming. Uh, it's really an honor to be with you all tonight. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen for my presentation. Oops. Okay. So as Tom said, I'm in a diploma unit at the AA currently, which is called Diploma 6, and it's led by Jack Self and Guillermo Lopez. And we're a group of 12 students. This is about four, uh, I mean, half of us. And we're all from very international backgrounds. And this makes our projects very diverse because we tend to work in countries that we have. Um, uh, 
so of the unit, I would say, which is the diplomacy inevitability of climate emergency. Therefore, we don't believe in sustainability, but we pursue radical adaptation. And we work on domestic space because it's relatable for the general public and for its power to shape society at large. So just a quick example, this is uh, Marina's project, uh, which, is, which aims to bring back the idea of caring for water in the domestic setting of Lima, based on the ancient Inca canals um, of uh, that city. This is Karim's project, which is based in Egypt, and it looks at the idea of archaeological preservation in the Nile Delta in the face of um, rising sea levels. And this is Ash, Ash Arise project, which is looking at refugee shelters for displaced peoples in Zimbabwe following uh, natural disasters, such as hurricanes. And so a lot of the projects are dealing with water, whether it's the lack of it or the excess of it, and for good reasons. Uh, as you can see, climate instability is causing precipitation anomalies globally. And my fifth year project, which I'm still working on, is dealing with the excess of water in the UK, which is leading to um, floods. And so the UK is one of the regions of the world that is getting wetter. And in 2019, more rivers burst at banks than ever before, which resulted in a destructive and violent floodings. Um, five million Brits currently live on floodplains, and those areas are often occupied by the less wealthy members of society who are forced to evacuate and relocate because the town has little to no budget to prevent flooding. And those people are becoming the UK's first climate refugees. And so as Bruno Latour asks, how do we occupy a land if it is this land itself that is occupying us, that is fighting back? Uh, in my view, inhabitants of the floodplain need to, need to embrace the unpredictable and see it as an opportunity to reinvent their lifestyles. By adapting to floodplain, uh, floodplain houses to um, flooding, residents will be able to remain in their hometowns. So this is the Don Valley in South Yorkshire, which is one of the regions that was most dramatically floods, flooded in 2019. And in the 20th century, South Yorkshire was one of the most important regions for uh, coal mining and metallurgy in the UK leaving the region polluted and the its biodiversity sorry, slashed. And Sheffield sits on the River Don, but the 2019 flood had much worse impact on the smaller towns, especially downstream. Um, and that's because Sheffield is central to the region's uh, economy. Therefore, the water is essentially diverted from Sheffield, but it, in reverse, it flows uh, more violently and more powerfully to um, the other towns down the river which means that they are affected even worse than if there were actually no flood defenses anywhere. And so the project aims to restore the region's ecology while adapting floodplain housing typologies. Local authorities first um, adapt uh, the infrastructure to prevent flooding and implement natural flood management strategies, which can give us some uh, carbon negative materials, which are basically uh, materials that absorb uh, carbon from the atmosphere and they can be used to adapt um, houses on the floodplain. And so natural flood management is a mitigation strategy of, for the floodplain. And in South Yorkshire, it takes the form of woodland in strategic points in the valley, as well as introducing leaky barriers and reed beds. Catchment woodland ensures that groundwater um, is absorbed upstream by the plants and leaky barriers slow down erosion. And downstream, this is done by reed beds and wet woodland. So natural flood management is an approach to flood management that also includes the restoration of um, habitat of local fauna in a region damaged by industry. Thatch is made of reeds, which are a byproduct of the floodplain, and the reeds actually give us the opportunity to see the floodplain as a productive land. Oops, sorry. And I first tested this idea of the adaptive typology by designing a hybrid between a greenhouse and a domestic space raised on stilts above the floodplain. And the alluvium, which is left behind by the floods, um, enable a certain a new type of floodplain agriculture to emerge to grow water reeds. And those water reeds can be used as insulation and roofing material in the domestic area. And the town, I, the town I'm focusing on is Fish Lake, which was very badly uh, affected in the, 2000 November, uh, the November 2019 floods. And it's currently home to around 700 people to, who live in 200 houses. And Fish Lake is what we call a flood ghetto. Um, floodplain land is some of the cheapest to developers who build cheap and in no way differently than they would anywhere else, which means that the residents of Fish Lake live in houses that are completely inappropriate for their environment. 
In the 18th century, draining and uh, straightening works on the River Don, aiming to free more land to agriculture, actually worsened the flooding in Fish Lake. And soon after, dikes and drains were dug, but they're no longer sufficient. Um, during floods, the ground plane and public space are submerged, which means that transportation shifts from cars to boats, but the pedestrian public space is covered in water. And so the original landscape on the left is transformed to be uh, ready to hold more water than it currently can by widening the riverbeds and restoring the marshy area. Willow spilling is a low type method used to stabilize rapidly eroding river banks. And it also uh, ensures that there is a ground plane that continues to exist even when the land is flooded. The adaptation of electrical access boxes um, to flooding is also a crucial part of uh, living on the floodplain. When access boxes get flooded, the electricity has to be cut off from the whole town, leaving it in the dark for hours. And so the new design is placed on top of the existing access boxes in the town. And they are um, two meter high cylinders with a watertight door that can be opened to access the pipes below. And the new structure becomes a landmark of the floodplain, a public object similar to the phone box or the post box, except that its design is inspired from the butter cross, which is a stone structure in Fish Lake and in other towns of, the, of England. They used to indicate a marketplace. And because it contains life jackets and an emergency location number, um, the new access box needs to be visible from far away, hence the red color. Um, adapting existing houses on the floodplain is a shift in the approach humans have to flooding. Flood barriers that we currently use uh, are used to fight nature. We need to adapt and actually let the water flow. So the houses in the town of Fish Lake are adapted by adding prostheses that are elevated above the flood water and adaptation enables the people of Fish Lake to continue living in their house. So the house I chose to test this on is Elton House on the right, which is also highlighted on the map on the left, which is on the southern edge of the town, closest to the river, and therefore one of the first ones to flood. And in 2019, the floods reached a height of 1.2 meters and stayed for three days. All the rooms on the ground floor were flooded, and the engineering rule of thumb is that for structural reasons, if a house floods higher than 50 centimeters, the residents should not attempt to flood proof it. Therefore, the flood waters should be allowed to flow inside the ground floor. This means that the prosthesis needs to contain a kitchen, a toilet, a lounge, and a living dining room. And the adapted house and the prosthesis are one overall design, which is elevated above the floodplain so as to be able to function even in times of flood. The adapted house is raised above the existing ground floor with the help of stilts, moving the whole house on the first floor. And only the original brick walls remain on the ground floor with added columns when needed. Um, through natural flood management and the freeing of the ground in the village, the project enables biodiversity to, return, to return to the region. And garden centers in the region encourage homes, homeowners to adapt their gardening habits to flooding, uh, planting species that actually thrive in um, this wet environment. The first floor is split into two spaces, the living space and the prosthesis and two steps up in the original brick house, the bedroom and the bathroom space. And the wall of the prosthesis are made of uh, polycarbonate and the original brick facade is whitewashed and becomes an interior wall. The um, steps separate the, the existing from the new and, the, and keep the feeling of a house. And materi ma building materials are sourced regionally through the natural flood management, like soft hazel coppice uh, to build walls such as uh, water and door walls or reeds, which could be used for uh, thatched uh, roofs, which replace the original roof. And this new uh, building guidebook can be applied to all the buildings in the village, including community spaces like pubs, which enable residents to continue meeting even in times of floods. Flooding is seen as a catastrophic event currently because we try to resist the water. Adaptive design um, gives us the opportunity to live with climate instability in a symbiotic way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, yeah, it's really compelling to see the way that you've synthesized um, a lot of the issues that we've been talking about so far tonight. And I hope that's kind of given people a, a sense of how architecture can begin to engage with, with some of these uh, agendas and topics. So um, yeah, before we move into discussion as a whole group, we're just going to again go into the, the small breakout rooms. 
Um, so really the idea of this is to make the evening as participatory as possible so that all of you will have the opportunity to discuss the issues that have been raised with with other people present. Um, so yeah, I hope, I hope you make use of this opportunity. Um, so I believe that our tech team are, are currently setting those up. We'll go into those for about nine minutes. And there are, there are these three kind of suggestions. So you, initially you could share your kind of reactions and thoughts on what you've heard in those presentations. The, the second question is around how we should change the way we make buildings and cities. And then thirdly, um, we're interested to know what, how or, or rather what architects or architecture could take from the BEEP adaptation agenda. So yeah, um, you'll be put into those breakout rooms now for about nine minutes. Um, do remember to be concise and make sure everyone gets a chance to speak. And after that, we'll come back to, um, to a whole group discussion and then finish for the evening. Hello, so yes, welcome back and hope you had some good discussions in those breakout sessions. So our tech team are now going to launch a second poll and the results of this will be made available at the end of the evening. Um, just a technical reminder as well that on Zoom you can switch between speaker view and gallery view. So depending on how you want to um, observe the next uh, portion of the meeting. So at this point, we're going to move into some questions for, from the floor. And in true ACAN fashion, we are now going into extra time. So um, yeah, I do hope that some of you are able to stick around for another 15 minutes or so um, while we have a, a question and answer discussion together as a group. So first up, I believe we have a question from Tabitha um, for Bill Gething. So Tabitha, you're going to be unmuted and you can ask your question. Hello, I'm assuming you can hear me. Yeah, brilliant. Hello, Bill. It's good to meet you again. Um, I'm Tabitha. I work for Trada and the TTF. I normally talk to students about and professionals about timber. Um, but great talk i'm really surprised you don't get disheartened so 10 years ago you know doing really really great work but from your graphs like what are the direct numbers we need to aim for on a sliding scale to reach zero carbon targets everything's always put down in percentages and that doesn't give anybody a clear um target to aim for i just wonder if you know you've got any figures that we could on a sliding scale we could be aiming towards Oh gosh, that's a really difficult question. Sorry. And, uh, and out of the, you know, I think it might vary from project to project. I can't get, I can't give you direct numbers. Um, I mean, to, that, that's more or less hit, heading for the mitigation agenda rather than the adaptation agenda. So, to, I mean, basically, uh, I think something like passive house standard is a really good one. Um, that's fine for new build. I think for, for retrofit, it's much more complicated and of the complexities about how much you can insulate existing buildings, particularly solid wall historic fabric buildings without um, causing trouble. Um, on, on adaptation, I think, um, I mean, there, there are standards starting to emerge in terms of the kinds of climates one should be um, designing for. I, it, until quite recently, there was no consensus on what 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 was a, an acceptable standard what what's a, a reasonable standard um, and you had to make it had to make up your own mind about that um i mean clearly i i think it's probably mad to to design for a climate that, that is less than two degrees of global warming um because i think we, we will struggle to achieve that and if we do that's be great and maybe we've over designed slightly but that that that's certainly an absolute minimum um, does that answer your question at all yeah, yes, it's getting there. And I think, yeah, Pester's House is at the moment almost like the only standard that really puts figures 
towards it and Enerfit obviously for the retrofit or the adaptation yeah. also but uh, it would just be nice to see people putting figures down as a percentage because then it does it mean that everybody's having to go back to you know 2010 or 2000 to look no, at what it was I think hard numbers mm -hmm. hard numbers is the answer because yeah yeah right. it's too complicated mm. to introduce. Well, yeah, thank you very much for that question, Tabitha and Bill, for your response. Um, so next, we have a question from Joe Giddings, and yeah, this is for Jean. So, Joe, over to you. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, um, I guess this is actually a bit of a crude question because I, I do understand that uh, mitigation and adaptation need to be looked at in equal measure, but. Um, it's about flooding and just the idea of accepting flooding and whether in creating architecture to adapt to it and, and focusing on that, uh, are we missing out on some really good um, ways and kind of natural technologies, which you, which you did talk about, that we know that can mitigate the worst of it. Um, in the book Wilding, Isabella Tree talks about the restorative power of the beaver. Um, they chew down trees and they make dams and they can contribute to uh, uh, the kind of re-meandering of, of natural ri river paths. So should we be pushing for the reintroduction of beaver to the UK landscape, which is currently not allowed? Um, Sonny, you should mention that. Sorry about the noise, I just started hailing, so it might be a bit noisy. But um, I looked at beavers a lot. It was kind of like my number one inspiration at the beginning of the project um, and that's kind of the approach that I had in terms of the concept of the project I really wanted it to be to us to kind of imitate beavers in a way and I feel I feel like obviously rewilding is a very important part of um, where we should be going and of course of my project because you know just like using the natural flood management is not only a strategy to bring back certain plants in certain areas to mitigate flooding but also um, animals need to be used for that because beavers are actually have a huge uh, impact on um, forests and marshes etc so um, yeah I think it doesn't need to stop at beavers there's a lot of other animals that need to be brought back and biodiversity especially in regions that have been destroyed so much by um, uh, industries such as uh, Yorkshire has been so yeah definitely thank you very much Sean. Um, so I have a question for Kay, um, and it's, it's potentially quite a topical question in light of recent events that we discussed. Um, so we've, we've seen the response of wealthy nations to, you know, to, to climate disasters so far, uh, yeah, so far, which is basically to close the borders and keep out the vulnerable people who have done the least to contribute to this crisis and who are least equipped to to deal with it. Um, so this is what Naomi Klein refers to as climate barbarism. Um, so my question is how can we enable a more kind of humane or empathetic response and is does this work have to happen in particular disciplines like architecture or you know is that something that has to happen at a, a general societal political level or is it in fact both of those things? Thanks, Tom. That's a great question. Um, well, I think what, what I'm really, what really, I mean, what, what strikes me about um, ACAN is that third demand of yours. I can't remember the detail of it, but about a cultural transformation. And, um, and I think that that underpins everything, right? It's, it's, it, culture has this soft ability to permeate through everything through and it's and it's really on those terms that politics can shift and um, because it's with changing hearts and minds that we might then change um, policy or how things operate um, so I, I don't know what it would look like in the architectural world to unless you want to just dismantle borders or do some creative work on, on, on actual borders um, to, to get people across. Um, but I think it, this is, there's, yeah, sadly a lot of work still to be done in um, healing and repairing a lot of division um, 
and addressing a lot of hate and, and oppression. And um, we can see that on the small micro scale in our everyday lives and on the bigger political stage. And um, if you ever feel that, oh, well, I can't change this, then I would really encourage you to rethink that because I think we all, just even in the conversations that we have with each other, you know, we cannot know the ripple effects of what we do and what we say and how things might snowball or evolve. Um, so holding conversations like this, um, I think having more circles to, to really Un, to really understand what we mean by climate justice because I think that that's that that penny is only really dropping in the developed world or, or, or those that have only recently kind of woken up for lack of a better phrase off the top of my head to um, the scale of, of, of the, the impact of, of the climate and ecological emergency um, so it's non it's ongoing it's an ongoing and um, task with um, which we should all be a part of in, 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 in having dialogue about. So there's no easy answer to that question, but I hope I've been able to address it in some way, Tom. Thank you. Yeah, it's really good to get your thoughts. And um, yeah, just say in ACAN, I think we, we kind of recognise that there's really a need now to, um, to build a more joined up movement that sees environmental and social justice as inherently connected issues. Um, so there's work to be done there. Um, okay, great. So next we're going to go to a question from Hattie. And I, again, I think this is for you, Bill. Hi, Bill. Hi, Hattie. Uh, good to see you. Um, I know you've been working on this issue now and you mentioned, I didn't realize that your book was as long ago that you had, you know, almost a decade now. And I'm just wondering, do you, feel or do, do you feel there's more awareness in the industry and more demand for clients and understanding about the need to design for adaptation is it changing i mean obviously there's you know in the last year been a huge surge of awareness generally about climate emergency but adaptation specifically is that on people's radar um i think it's it is it's improving i think 10 years ago no one was really thinking about it and no one really had the tools to think about it um i think the design for future climate project did help a lot in that and started to help people put some calipers on the problems uh, and get interested in it um and i think more and more there are examples where you really do have to consider climate um, issues so things like the bream uh, system now has a has a climate um you know, so you can get some points for proving that your your building can um, uh, is resilient to particular climate um, scenarios. And if you're making you know, planning applications in parts of London, like Islington, you're required to demonstrate that your building is resilient to overheating um, to 2020s and 2050s, 90th percentile um, climates, um, which can be extremely challenging. Um, it has to be said. Um, so I think I think things are improving, but I think you know until we start regulating this, I think it, I don't think it works, but you know, voluntary um, because um, you know the, all the financial drivers are against it. Really, again, as I said in my talk, you know, mm -hmm. normally you're ending up spending more money to to save someone money, someone else money in the future, and mm. you know it does it just doesn't work. Um, so it, if we're driven by money, which is what we are, <laughs> um, then I think you have to use money or regulation to change things. Mm. Thank you. So, yeah. So they are looking at introducing overheating criteria in building rates, for example. Whether it will come or not, I don't know. So we have a, a question next from sam turner and sam's asked if i'll read this question for him so this speaks to um the the kind of political context of all of this and we'd like to invite all the speakers to come in on this in our current political climate of denial and reaction how can we wrestle the narrative to building positively for an unknown future 
when we struggle to manage current problems. So, um, yeah, Jean, maybe maybe you could start us off with that one. Um, I mean, all I could say in terms of my project and research that I've done this year is that um, we're not paying enough attention to the people who, first of all, who are already climate refugees and who are already suffering from the climate crisis. Uh, and we're not even imagining that some people in our wealthy, privileged countries are actually going to be affected or it stays in a very superficial way. I think we talk about agriculture more and more, but people like, you know, the residents of Fish Lake in my project, for instance, when no one really thinks about them and what's going to happen to them and the fact that they're underprivileged and they don't have money and the, the insurance in those kind of cases are very um, complicated, obviously. And I think that there needs to be more attention towards those people and not just um, other countries, basically. And the reason that I decided to focus my project on a small town rather than London, which is also obviously a floodplain land, and without the um, Thames Barrier, we would, I mean, it, it, it would flood every day, which it actually does in some places, um, is that those people are actually already having to move away and there's already not enough housing in our big cities. So imagining that we're going to have to host more people and build more housing when there's already a housing crisis. Uh, that's why I think I really focused on small villages. Um, yeah, don't know if that answers it. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, Kay, maybe, maybe you'd like to come in on this as well. Yeah, I think, um, like Jean has said, many of the um, current problems that we are facing now anyway, um, or that some are, such as flooding, um, or even um, you know, food prices going up, you know, uh, because of because of drought, perhaps in a country that we that we rely upon for our food. I think the task is to is to do more work in connecting the story, so that the story of the of the of the everyday problem actually may well be connected to the climate and ecological crisis. Um, and, and as Bill speaks of, we're, we're in a culture, and again, to go back to culture, in a culture that is motivated um, by money and the market forces. And so that's what are the impacts of that. We're having to work more. We're having, we live um, maybe much less, uh, more unhealthy lives than we would otherwise. Uh, we may not eat as well as we would otherwise. We may not have time to exercise or enjoy green spaces as we might otherwise. And, and actually all of that connects to a consumer capitalist culture that is based upon um, extracting from the earth. So I think that, that I think there's still a big job to be done in the storytelling, which I suppose is where I sit. Um, but we can all do that. We can all connect these stories more um, to make it to to highlight the relatability, um, whilst also recognizing that yeah, we have to start from where people are. Um, you. you people do have their everyday concerns and that's where you have to start from. You have to meet people where they are. Is there anything you'd like to, to add to that at all, Bill? Well, I, I tend to attack these things in a more technical ap approach. I mean, it, we, we know an awful lot about the future <laughs> and we know it's going to get hotter. We, we just simply don't know quite how fast it's going to get hotter and, and all the things that then go with that. So we, we shouldn't kid ourselves. We know, we know what's coming if we if just, you know, in our brains, but it's our hearts that, um, unfortunately, and our wallets, actually, that don't seem to be answering. Um, and, and things like overheating, which I got interested in when I was looking at you know, future climate issues. Um, but overheating is a current problem. You know, the endless flats in London, uh, single-sided, ventilated flats with too much glass um, which overheat now hugely so and because the, we've changed radically the way we build because we're focusing on the mitigation agenda trying to keep warm in winter and we forgot about trying to keep cool in summer so we change from a country now where the problem is keeping warm and it, it is rapidly becoming a problem to keep cool and we just don't know how to do it so we do know we do know what's coming it's do we have the balls or the drive to um, to change? I'm afraid. 
we've, um, we've actually got really good follow-up to that from um, a question from Phil Simpson. Again, this is for you, Bill, um, kind of building on that theme. So, yeah, if the tech team could unmute, unmute Phil, please. Um, is Phil still in the room? Yeah, no, just took a yeah. while to unmute now with you. Um, right. Are you pleased to know someone has privately messaged me to say they may have access to the data? So, um, uh, but worth asking for the group generally. Bill, my question was um, you mentioned PHP, you, know, you mentioned Passive House, sorry, specifically. Yeah. And uh, I wondered, did you know of any data sets that can be used in PHP to model future scenarios? Uh, someone has messaged me to say they can point me in the right direction, but maybe you can tell the group as well. Yes, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I can't uh, immediately give you a, a website, but um, I do know that um, David Gale, Gale and Snowden, uh, they did one of the, they did some passive house projects for the um, Design for Future Climate project. And they got hold of, of climate data. I think they may have used a sort of modified version of the Prometheus files, um, which are available as, as free downloads. But perhaps getting in touch with David Gale would be um, a good next step. Or I can do that if you want. Yeah, great. That I've also, I've also, as I said, got a handy email from someone else in the group who sent me, so I'll be in contact with them. Okay. So. I'll, I'll check their response too. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. So yeah, I just wanted to um, maybe we've got time for a couple of more, couple more questions, and I'm just going to abuse my privilege as chair to jump in with one another follow-up question for Kay. Um, so you know these topics are. Uh, are quite emotive and quite kind of difficult to deal with on a sort of psychological level and in XR there's there's a lot of talk about um, climate grief and and how you kind of deal with this so I'm just wondering kind of for people here what what kind of strategies and coping mechanisms or yeah what kind of frameworks are available for people to to kind of cope with that yeah, um, it's it's worth asking that question. Um, I mean, it's uh, something that Jen Bendel actually directs people to is the Climate Psychology Alliance, and they've developed therapeutic support to groups and individuals who are experiencing distress um, in light of the current climate change predicament. Um, and um, I suppose, as, as you may well be doing with this network yourself, holding space to just talk from a non-professional point of view, um, but just as humans, you know, as Bill says, you know, there's something about the heart and all of this. Um, how does this affect us personally? It's really important to, to, to ask those questions and to share. Um, because then you can you can move through it, you know, and you can move through it. And, and that grief, um, that that change curve that I showed, um, starting from the shock and denial and then moving through to despair, depression, and, and coming out the other side with acceptance and, and in that some, maybe some kind of transformation and ability to take action. But it is actually, you know, it's not a smooth journey. You might find yourself jumping all over the place and one day just wake up being extraordinarily angry and that's totally legitimate. Um, so continue to, to find those spaces and allies to, to speak with each other and to move, move, move your body, I'd say as well. Um, but yeah, the Climate Psychology Alliance is probably a good place for, for some solid resources. Thank you very much. And if I can maybe just add something quick to that. Um, absolutely. We all had, I mean, all, all of us um, in my unit all had quite severe eco-anxiety at the beginning of the year because we were only doing research. And the moment we're really switched and we weren't eco anxious but actually excited about those projects is when you actually start doing something about it because i feel like if you stay in research and you know we all started with jen bandel like that's the first thing we did even before we actually met um which was obviously a big blow and then doing a lot of research on I mean, everything that's going on and that is going to happen um is not productive and i think that the only sort of medicine for eco anxiety is actually being productive and imaginative and just doing these things and obviously talking about it with other people like you're definitely not alone going through this um so yeah so i'm conscious of time um but i think that's a really excellent point to 
to kind of wrap up on actually. Um, so yeah, I hope we can all, all take that sentiment with us um, as we leave this evening. So yeah, apologies if we didn't get to your question. Um, we are very time limited in these things, but you are very welcome to join us in the pub session after this, which will be kicking off around nine o'clock and we continue can continue discussions um, more informally. So yeah, at this point, I'm just going to hand back to Eva to, to close the session for us. Thank you, Tom. Um, whew, that was good. Um, thanks for all the speakers. Um, I'm just going to share the results for the poll because um, I'm sure you guys are curious to see. Give me one second and they should pop on your screen shortly. I hope you can see the results um, on your screen. Can someone just nod because <laughs> I'm not 100% sure? Great. Um, so yeah, um, it's just, I think after this, uh, this whole evening, it just highlights um, everyone's concern and wanting to tackle mitigation and adaptation full on equally, it seems. Um, and on the second question of how ACAN can respond or do more about it, we've got um, the highest result for um, creating a working group to tackle uh, this on a higher level. So we'll be working and focusing on that. Um, and just to wrap up for tonight, um, a few final comments. Um, I hope you all enjoy this. It has been quite a lot to take on, um, but thank you all for joining us and for the energy. Uh, it has really made the evening. And of course, thanks to the great speakers. Um, it, was, it was really lovely having you all and a bit upsetting, but we're gonna have to deal with it um, and uh, digest that. Uh, just wanted to highlight that this recording uh, should be shortly up on our website or, or on um, the YouTube channel that we have. Um, and we are welcoming everyone to send us some feedback um, and suggestions for, um, for future uh, events and for ACAN in general. Um, we, will, we are considering having a small break from those large events and open meetings online, but we'll be still active and working on campaigns. So if you want to get in touch or join us, um, please drop us an email. Uh, and last but not least, we're going to be joining the pub for um, the Bishop's Arms for some more informal discussions. So if anyone still wants to have a chat um, or have a drink with us, please join us shortly. The link will be on uh, in the chat in a bit and in the email. So I'm just gonna mute everyone, unmute everyone now um, so that you can all have a, a like applause each other um, and have a clap and uh, say goodbye to each other. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Lovely. And I'll play a bit of music at the background if it works. Lovely.